Hi everyone, I'm Diego with uh, Monster Vine, and I'm here with. Uh, oh my God, I don't know what's up with the morning. It's like it's fifty. Morning. It's fifty degrees in Seattle, so it's like the the air is just cold. Super dry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you could introduce yourself. Please. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I'm Kyle Rowley. Uh, I'm the game director on Alan Wake Two. It's nice to meet you. And nice to meet you too. Uh, so just to get straight into it it's been a bit of a minute since we've last seen uh alan wake and i know the original the first game was very heavily inspired by television uh, with its pacing and everything um with the evolution of how people are now consuming television has that with streaming and everything has that influenced the pacing or any other aspects with the sequel yeah, it's a it's a good question, and and you're right in the sense that I feel like, in a way, like Alan Wake One, it's kind of almost like mimicking how streaming services work right now, where it's like uh, you could consume the whole of the game broken up into episodes. It was a very, it was a nice way of obviously pacing the experience. So like people, you could play, you get to the end of an episode, and then uh, you could have a break, or you could decide I'm going to come back to later. And uh, and for the sequel, that that was something you know, even though we've changed the uh, uh, the structure in the sense that it's now hub based so we have like three hubs of Saga that you can basically freely explore you can come back to them and revisit them uh, so it's a lot more free roaming in that sense uh, and then obviously with, with the, the duality of the game where we have two playable characters Saga Anderson the FBI profiler and, and Wake and Alan Wake the, uh, the, the kind of tortured rider trapped in the dark place and even though we have those two playable characters and these two stories that you can switch between as you want, we still felt as important from a um, pacing perspective and also just from a like franchise perspective that we maintain that idea of chapters. Mm -hmm. So even though the first the first game we called them like episodes, which kind of mimicked uh, a TV show, for this game we're kind of leaning a bit more on this idea of like you know uh, a book or or fiction being written and then kind of breaking it up into what we call chapters. Um, so we we kind of made, we kind of main, maintained that 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 structure through through Alan Wake too because I do feel like it's like a nice pace setter. We really like the idea of like um, at the end of the, the the chapter like having some music that plays and you kind of get that nice feeling of like oh I've, I've accomplished something right. So we kind of wanted to keep that for for the sequel. And speaking of music, uh, I know Alan Wake was one of the first games that I can remember. Um, that use licensed music in particular to help emphasize or enhance a scene. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, what's the process of designing those moments? Like, do you guys like Casabian and American Nightmare, for example? Do you guys like think of a song that you really want to like include in the game first, and then just have to find the spot to place it, or do you think of the moment and say, you know what, I think a song, a licensed song, would really just kick this. Yeah, it's. it's 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 normally the it's normally the other way around where like we know kind of like the, the emotional beats that we want to tell and we want then we try and find a song that resonates i think there are, there have been some songs in the past um where this has been a song that we've kind of really liked and we wanted to find a place for it i remember when we were doing quantum break and the toto africa song that we have in the car sequence like that was just a song that we all kind of went oh we really want to put this in the game where can we find a spot for it um but yeah, in general, we try and design the, the 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 kind of emotional beats and the story beats that we want to hit, and then and then we'll find a song for it. For Alan Wake Two, though, we're kind of doing something completely different. Where like we we don't really have any licensed tracks, and all of the music that we're doing is actually being custom written for the game. So it's kind of like trying to take that idea, but kind of take it to the next level. So like we know what the emotional beats are through the story, and then we've kind of written, uh, we've collaborated with different uh, artists to basically write custom music for it. With custom lyrics that are based on you know uh aspects of the game or emotion or characters in the game or, or beats in the game so we try to okay. take music and utilize it uh in to the next level for this one cool and i work in advertising so i edit a lot of videos for my job and i'll editing videos to music is a definitely a skill i've had to learn when you have those songs and you have the moment for the song like how difficult is the process of fine tuning it? So like when the player gets to that moment, the beats are hitting in, in the, um, they feel intentional to what's happening on screen. 
Yeah, I mean, it's as you say, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a skill, and we have um, a great cinematics department who are kind of that their kind of speciality is kind of editing together like pieces of uh, narrative content to kind of create emotional responses from people, and you know, the the music layer is a is a part of that, and you know, it all starts from us kind of discussing early on, like from the screenplay level, like okay, this is kind of what we want to, this is what happens in the screenplay, and then. They there will be thing, things called out about like okay this 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 particular emotion we kind of want the player to feel here, um and then basically our, our, for like when it's when it's kind of custom music that's written at the score level, our like our composer Petri uh basically will go away, he'll take a look at like a very very rough edit of like those cinematic moments and then do a pass and then it's an iterative process from that point on like okay maybe we need to be um less, less melodramatic here and want it to be feel more uh scary or intense or you know this is kind of how the character's feeling so can we try and get that across in some way and we basically do a lot of iteration uh through uh through those different takes with the cinematic designers with the cinematic director with sam and with like the, the composer to try and try and land those emotional be beats it's the same for the end of chapter songs as well like we really want it to feel impactful so like you know it's like when does the cinematic cut what do we what do we cut on then we have like, okay, we want to kind of make, give it a bit of a pause. There's a bit of a breathing room to the player to kind of like digest what they've just seen. And then bam, hit them with like some emotional music that kind of resonates with just what they've seen. So it's kind of like a, it's like a, it is very much like e editing in a movie, I would say, in that, in that respect. And so the series is very, it wears its influences on its sleeves. Like you've got the King there, Hitchcock, Lynch, Twilight Zone, especially. Was there any modern media, books, movie, even maybe an album that really helped shape some of the influence in this second game? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, you're exactly right in the sense that, you know, the first game was heavily influenced by like Stephen King and, and David Lynch and Twin Peaks and and those kind of um, pop cult popular culture. For this game, um, because we have obviously added a new protagonist uh, who's an FBI profiler, and she went to, and she's kind of coming to the town of uh, Bright Falls to investigate these ritualistic serial killings. You know, we definitely started then looking at okay, uh, any kind of like TV shows or movies which kind of have that you know ritualistic feel to them. Like uh, you know, we we've often referenced like the first season of True Detective as something that we took quite a lot of inspiration from, not just because of uh, you know that these cops who are investigating these killings but just like the dynamic between the two characters like you know this kind of like buddy cop scenario and how they interact with each other how we how they like how they do storytelling when they're traveling to in between scenes in the car um, and then also just visually like how they kind of the mood wise like how what they the, the atmosphere they're trying to create there and then um in terms of horror very much like into uh a24's horror more modern take on horror like especially like ariaster's Hereditary and Midsummer, uh, Robert Eggers, like The Witch and Lighthouse, you know, because they're they're interesting for us because they're not like um, traditional horror where it's just purely about the anticipation of the scare and then the scare, and they're very much like horror on a, a an emotional level or like a character and drama level. It's like how it's the it's the feeling, the kind of the um, journey that those characters go through, the arc of that story. Um, and how that is not just scary on a sec like moment to moment level of like, oh, I'm scared about what's going to happen in the scene. But it's like after the movie's end ended, you've got like these these questions about like, what did this whole thing mean? Or like, you know, it's kind of creating those kind of like things that you kind of look back on and, and think about longer term. And those that was kind of very interesting to us just because we're making a narrative based game. And we wanted our horror to not just be scary in the second to second and moment to moment level, but also like longer term after the game's finished you're kind of thinking back on these questions and thinking about like this experience and 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 that was kind of very interesting to us no that's a great uh way to put it because i know particular with almost every one of those a24 horror films every time i've left the movie theater with my friends there was a long parking lot conversation just mm. digesting what we just watched and everything yeah exactly yeah it's kind of like it and i, I it also provokes like rewatches of them to kind of like because you have your own interpretations of how those movies kind of what they mean on, and what their kind of themes were and, and what the kind of questions they are asking 
and you will have your own answers, but then you kind of want to rewatch it to kind of go, okay, yeah, I think I'm right in this, or like, you know, it's just, it's thought provoking in a way that I don't think a lot of early horror movies were. And we really wanted to create that for the games as well. So I don't think that's something that's been explored too much in games. So, mm-hmm. and so uh, the other day I saw the film um, When Evil Lurks. And mm. when I left that film, fantastic, by the way. Um, something that really settled in my head was how it was like patiently unsettling um, as it like simmered before hitting you with those big moments. And I feel like when I played uh, Alan Wake 2 uh, the other week at the LA event, I got a ve- I had a very similar uh, situation there where it was like very patiently setting up all the horror before yeah. it finally kicks in. Yeah. Um, what is it like designing those moments? So like when they, when they hit, they like, they really like hit the players. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's very, you know, it's very easy to go into making a horror game and going, okay, well, as soon as you start, we want you to be like, we're going to add a jump scare and then we're going to add another jump scare. Then we, you know, and I think that for me, you know, one of the, one of my favorite horror games has always been Silent Hill, not because it's necessarily scary on a second to second level. Again, it's kind of, it creates an atmosphere and a mood and a sense of dread that kind of just builds up over a longer period of time. So we wanted to approach horror in the same way for this game where we were more interested in, you know, it can start off and it's more just like an unsettling feeling that you get when you're playing. It's not that you're necessarily scared, but, you know, it's the it's the feeling of something's not quite right. That can be like characters are talking to you in a weird way and you're just like something off about that person or like just it's eerily quiet or, you know, there's just something in the air that isn't quite feeling natural. And then just building that over the course of like one, we're, we were kind of very open to building that up over the course of like one or two hours where it's like, okay, we don't necessarily have to throw scares at you straight away. We can kind of send, create this mood because then when you get to the point where we actually do a reveal, it then has such it has a bigger reward because of the fact that there's been so much build up towards it. Um, and that's kind of like how we've generally tried to approach the, the horror in this game across the whole the whole experience. Like I said, we still will have some moments second to second, some kind of like, you know, there'll be something that moves and it will kind of make it will, it will startle you a little bit, which is fine. But it's still that like long term goal of trying to create an emotional response on the player from the atmosphere and this kind of unsettling mood that we're all kind of very interested in, in achieving. Mm-hmm. And so we've got Saga Anderson in this game. At what point in Alan Wake 2's development did you guys decide, okay, we need to have this secondary character in addition to Wake? Mm-hmm. It was, I would say it was pretty early on. Even when I joined the project, in 2019, the start of 2019, where we already had narratively this concept that we were going to have an FBI agent. That was something that was even like teased at in Quantum Break, where we did like a kind of like a Easter egg uh, video of like an agent and 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 Casey and and, and kind of scratch and stuff though, and those kind of things. Uh, so we kind of had this idea for a while, and the reason it's kind of important is because um, you know Alan Wake One came out in, in 2010, so we. 13 years at this point and we were quite aware that we needed to have um a method of because we, we don't want this game to be something that you know you have to have gone and played Alan with one you have to have played control you have to have played the awe expansion of control we didn't want you to have to do homework so we wanted to basically make their a perspective or a, view, a way into this game for players who have not played those things but can still enjoy it so adding a new character gives us a new hero character to the experience who's not aware of at the events of Alan Wake 1, who comes in basically fresh, coming there to investigate serial killings and then gets thrown into this supernatural horror story. And as she's learning what's happened in the past to Alan Wake and what the events of Alan Wake 1, players will learn with her. So even if you kind of have played the, the first game, and, but it was 13 years ago, you'll kind of get reminded about the events just through like her perspective, her point of view. So it's very important to us that we had that alternate, that alternate perspective for that very reason so yeah it's been there quite for for, for at least uh for the, this concept for this game and then maybe just a little bit before that too cool and speaking of control um with alan wake appearing in the alan wake expansion and control and uh ati the janitor appearing 
in this game doing the karaoke like he said he would be. Um, at what point did you guys decide that, yeah, we want to make this like a connected universe sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Control started out, the concept for Control actually started out as a as a sequel to Alan Wake. So like <laughs> like a lot of our games, they start off out as, a, as some kind of concept for Alan Wake 2. And then, uh, you know, the, the game direction at the time was we wanted to make it more open, which obviously you saw in Control, but we wanted to make it way more like action and gameplay first rather than narrative first. Um, a lot more reliance on more systemic features and the like. And during the during the concepting of that game, it came, came to the conclusion that maybe we shouldn't, this isn't really feel right for, for Alan Wake game, but maybe let's start a new IP and that became Control. And then when we were developing, uh, uh, developing Control, you know, we had we 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 had this idea of like a a, um, a government agency who's kind of investigating these kind of supernatural events. And um, when we were making control, we were like quite early on going, okay, I think that even though this is an Alan Wake sequel, it's a new IP. I think we we should kind of connect them still. But we were quite aware that we didn't really want to kind of make that public information before Control came out because. You know, we wanted Control as an IP to stand by itself. We didn't want it to become like, oh, it's like a sequel to Alan Wake because it's kind of like it's connected. We wanted it to be its own thing and then allow players to discover those connections by themselves because I think that's also just made it much more impactful for players who kind of coming in, just expecting a kind of new IP and then realizing that all these kind of all these events are connected. So we kind of knew during, during the development of Control that we wanted to connect them. We just didn't want to make it public information until actually after the fact. Yeah, no, my... My best friend and I, we uh, we try to play Alan Wake like at least every year on Halloween. And oh, nice. so when, when Control came out and we were playing it at the same time, th there were parts where we were like, I think this might be connected to Alan Wake. No. Yeah. And like the further we got along and read more of those little documents, we're like, oh, yeah, this is total. Oh, they're connecting them. Yeah, I, and, think, yeah. I think also I think it's nice because like once you say Control and you kind of read about you know, their perspective on the events of Alan Wake, going back and playing Alan Wake after with that context in mind kind of switches the the perspective a bit about the story of Alan Wake as well. So yeah. I think it's, it's kind of interesting. And again, on Control, like one of my favorite aspects in it is the sort of silhouetted apparition hotline calls in it. I like, I've yeah. never seen anyone in games or film or television do something like that. I thought it was just a really clever way of doing that. And then in Alan Wake 2, you brought that back in uh, Saga's profiling moments. Mm. Like, was there a particular, like, inspiration that, like, birthed that idea or? I don't think so. I think we we just, we've always been a studio who likes to mix media, like different types of forms of media. So even going back to Max Payne, we've utilized live action in our games. And we've always tried to be experimentation, like experiment with it. Like, you know, with Quantum Break, we went very, uh, you know, well, this is like, we're going to try live action. It's going to be a separate thing. And you kind of, it gives you a different perspective into the world of Quantum Break, but it's still a live action. And then when we were doing Control, we knew we wanted to use live action, but we wanted to find another interesting way of utilizing it from, from a storytelling perspective. And I don't know, I can't remember how exactly who came up with it, but I remember seeing that live action footage blended on top of the game in, in 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 real time, and I think that that when people saw that they were just like, "This is gonna, this is awesome. We can use this in in kind of like a nice visual storytelling way." We used it with Polaris and we used it with Trench, obviously. And then after we kind of established that as a nice, very interesting way of like getting across narrative information, it kind of just made sense for us to kind of like take that and expand upon it even more for for Alan Wake Two. But you know, again, it's it's trying to find a way to make it so that it contextually makes sense. Um, I think that us utilizing it in, for, for Saga's profiling, it just kind of, when we were thinking about this idea of like, okay, she's a profiler, we really want to represent profiling in, a, in an interesting way, visually and, and audibly. How can we do that? Originally we had idea, we had like concept where it's like two characters in cinematics kind of talking to each other. And then we were like, well, first of all, that's gonna be really expensive. So let's not do that. But also we, we kind of like already have this kind of technique of utilizing live action. So maybe we can find a way to utilize that to kind of get across that, you know, the other character's thoughts in Saga's head. And that's kind of just like where it came from. And then we've been utilizing it in various other ways as well. Like in Alan Wake 2, for the first time, we actually take game footage that we've recorded and blend that on top of other game footage to kind of show 
the overlapping worlds of the dark place and the Pacific Northwest to show those those connections, those echoes. So yeah, it's just been a gradual process, project by project. Like how can we utilize uh, our, our visual effects technology and live action to create nice visual ways of doing storytelling? Yeah, and speaking of the live action, when you're designing the game, do you have like moments where you're like, this needs to be a live action moment? Like, how do you decide when to insert those and not? Yeah, we always, we've known from very early on that we wanted to use live action for a lot of the exploration content. So, and again, we've done this in a lot of Remedy's previous projects. So like the Darling videos and Control, we wanted, we knew we, we kind of already have that as like in our uh, narrative tools, tool set. Like we know that we have cinematics, we know we have live action in world live action. Um, but what we didn't know for, for for this project was like how we, we kind of, wanted to use full screen live action, but we, we weren't exactly sure how we wanted to use it. We didn't want to do what we did in Quantum Break where it's kind of like gameplay and then live action and gameplay, like separated into chapters. But we want so, but we knew we wanted to do it and it took a little while for us to kind of like, we just had a, a bunch of constraints that we, if we were gonna do it, it needed to one, like be a part of the narrative in a meaningful way. So it can't just be like we're switching medium, it needs to be something that enhances the actual narrative of the game. It needs to actually kind of be connected and and integrated in a seamless manner. And then also just from a like gameplay and, and like player feel perspective, it needed to feel like it was still being something the player was initiating and uh, uh and was not something that was you were just passively watching the whole for, for a long period of time, basically. Mm -hmm. So we had we that's not kind of like the constraints we had. And then we basically over time we were like, okay, we can utilize this. Because we utilize live action, full screen live action a lot in the in, in the dark place with Alan's with Alan's stuff. And we're using it on a meta narrative level of like moving in and out of different types of realities inside the dark place. Because you know the dark place is this nightmare version of New York where kind of like things shift and change. And Alan himself is kind of on like many different level meta levels of like storytelling as the writer and this kind of like fictional detective who's kind of following this 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 case and then going into live action we kind of go to another level so you know it's all part of this kind of meta meta level storytelling that that we kind of do in the dark place so and just to try to keep an eye on the time just to round off this interview um, is there some is there like a when players finally get the game in a couple of weeks um is there a particular feeling or that you want them that or you hope that they get out or experience that they get out of the game when they finish yeah. it i think that it kind of comes back to what we were talking earlier about the types of horror that we want to create and the types of stories we want to create i think that for sure i want people to be a bit scared you know it's a horror game we try to kind of create some atmospheric some atmosphere there and that's on the second to second level, but I would like I, I, once they finish the game that they they kind of they look back and they have questions or they start they think about the story longer term. They're not just like oh I'm finished with that I'm going to put that away I'll go on to the next thing. But it kind of like lingers in their mind and they think about it when they're when they're kind of having a coffee or they kind of go just before they're going to bed or you know go and having a shower or whatever like oh yeah what's that mean and then kind of then come back and, and talk about it with their friends and be like what do you think now that would be I think that would be a win from from us like if that if that's kind of like that that was that was how people perceived the story or, or kind of interpreted the story after they finished it. Cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to no speak worries, with man. Me thank about you this. a lot for talking to us. <laughs>